I'd like to uh, thank all the co-chairs for being with us in this opening tenry and also Nirmala Sitharaman, whom I'm actually going to get to start off and just tell us what it is that India is actually doing to continue to transform the potential that we've been speaking about into actual action. And yes, there are things in the last couple of years to be, to be quite proud of. The growth rate continues to be buoyant, continues to grow. Um, and now India is the fastest growing economy uh, in the world, well ahead of China. So I'm going to ask each of you, if I may, the, all the co-chairs to spend maybe two or three minutes in just outlining for us the progress that you think has been made to transform India's potential into reality. And perhaps also give us your one or two ideas of what you think the urgent priority should be uh, going forward. And I think that will that will shed, shed a lot of light here. Um, I just want to introduce, uh, not that most of you need any introduction, but I quickly will introduce the entire panel out here. Nirmala Sitaraman, of course, is the Minister of State for Commerce and Industry in India. Uh, John Rice is the Vice Chairman of GE uh, at uh, Hong Kong SAR. Anil Agarwal, Executive Chairman Vedanta Resources. Uh, thanks a lot for being with us. Vijay Shekhar Sharma is uh, Founder and Chief Executive Officer of PTM. Amitabh Kant, Chief Executive Officer Niti Ayog. Uh, Johan Orik is the Global Managing Partner and Chairman of the Board at AT Kearney. And Kita Gopinath is Professor of Economics at Harvard University and, of course, a young global leader. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, Nirmala Sitharaman, if I could just turn that, that question to you. So, yes, a certain number of positive steps have been taken, GST in particular. But I'm sure there are specific items on your agenda for the next five or six months or one year so that India continues to go up the competitiveness ladder. We've broken into the top 40, which is a matter of some pride, but I'm sure you won't be content with that. Absolutely not. We need to work harder. We need to um, take the states on board. I'm happy to say they're working together with us. Um, there is definitely a lot of uh, regulatory mechanisms which go down to the level of the local bodies, the municipalities, uh, the panchayats, all of which will have to be eased out. And uh, therefore, our next four or five months will definitely, as was in the last one year, um, our attention would be to work together with them, take out all those which are obstructionist, and ensure that businesses feel far more assured that uh, uh, the ease is actually coming in in uh, their activity. Also, to, um, I'm happy to say that uh, the FDI flow is really very good, but we also have to translate that into meaningful investments and rapidly get them on to uh, translate into job creation, uh, output creation, and so on. So they can't just be investments coming in, but rapidly also move on to the phase where the production takes place. Uh, exports happen from them. They're not going to be producing just for India, but they're also going to be producing to export from India. So these are things on which we are working. There is a, a, a slight gap between India's position in the competitiveness index and the ease of doing business index. In, I mean, in competitiveness, India's top 40, but not in the ease of doing business. And that clearly is a direction, along with better infrastructure, that clearly signals the direction in which we need to move as a country. Yes, absolutely. And uh, also, uh, you raised the point of uh, infrastructure. Uh, that affects our competitiveness, no doubt. But it's also a question of uh, effectively converting all that is produced in India, particularly in the rural areas, particularly th uh, tier three uh, uh, towns, so that better market access is provided. The uh, back-end facilities will have to be created. So there is a comprehensive agenda of work which is pending, which is ongoing, but more to achieve. So there are going to be interministerial um, work uh, assessment and also ensuring that work moves fast. Um, the interministerials will also be happening uh, just to ensure that this goal is achieved. Right. Um, John Rice, if I could turn to you next. What to your mind is it that India needs to do next? And um, in particular, if you could also touch on the theme of, of infrastructure, which is uh, an area I'm sure you've been, you've been studying in great uh, depth. Sure. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, the mission, as the minister has described uh, and others, is sustainable, inclusive growth. Uh, there's a lot of things that factor into that. You've got to create a million jobs a month, and you want to keep those jobs. So you ha the, the, that puts a priority on, on skill building, creating 
the right skills to do the jobs well, uh, it puts a priority on productivity because you won't keep those jobs if you don't engage in productive activities. So productivity has to continue to improve. And I would offer a, a simple suggestion, too. We're a big proponent and participant in Make India. We have been from the beginning. Uh, we've announced significant investments in Bihar and Pune, and, and we love what we're doing here. I think more of an e emphasis should be put on exports because the true benchmark for what you're building in any location around the world is your ability to compete on a global scale. So if you're not exporting, you're, you might not be competitive. We're happy that we, we export 50% of what we manufacture in India, but maybe that should be higher. And I think just as a side note, uh, the, the country ought to think about an export credit agency. There are some 60 countries around the world that support manufacturing exports with active export credit agencies, and I think India should be one of those. Uh, Anil Agarwal, um, you know, one of, India has obviously had a great success in creating global companies, not always from within India. If you look at the number of global companies that are headed or CEO'd or chaired by, by Indians, is actually quite, quite staggering. Uh, what are the impediments in building out those global companies right here in this country? No, it is a uh, phenomenal time. We have, uh, in Vedanta, we have raised uh, last 10 years $30 billion abroad, 2 lakh crore, and invested all the money, most of the money, into India. And we have found that the, how the, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this regime, this government, uh, 1.3 billion people, tremendous opportunity, tremendous opportunity. I never, I never felt uh, in last two decades, this kind of buzz, what, what is happening about India in the world, which I have seen and I'm, I'm feeling it. It's very important that we, we develop our SMEs. SMEs are the need of our, is a startup, is SMEs. Right. Uh, Vijay Shekhar Sharma, if I, I mean, if you look at the topic uh, specifically, it, it actually says, how can India transform the state of its economy and people? through digital transformation, and digital India is obviously a big theme of, of the government as well. Um, you're clearly one of the people who believe in that. And do you think that the digital economy and the startup economy, which you exemplify perhaps better than anyone else whom I can think of, is that really the path that India should take? The old economy stuff is all very well and it's great, but if India is really going to transform it, will be by taking leadership in the digital world. I fundamentally believe that uh digital economy offers unparalleled opportunity to India because we've traditionally been building software for the Western countries or developed countries. And this is for the first time that India itself is consuming significant amount of technology produced, which is in the form of mobile apps and financial inclusion and retail commerce and sorts of services. And I think for the first time what we're seeing is that Indians are very proud for producing for India. Otherwise, we used to have a brain drain. Most of the time you will get out of an engineering college and the best thing that you should do probably for your career used to be called go USA or go in a other country and work there. And that is why we have a great number of CEOs and chairmen like we talked about in the world. But now it is sort of considered as a level two or level three option. The first option is always about opening a startup with the kind of push that Indian government is pushing on startup in the India agenda or working for a technology which is going to serve the Indians. I'm very proud that Indian entrepreneurs are not trying to replicate what has been built but accepting that we have to build something for India. And Something for India that we will build will generate larger dividends for entrepreneurs in this country because we will have a much larger audience left from the Western company servicing audience. Uh, if you see Facebook, Google, or all sorts of Western countries, companies, they have more or less served the first billion audience, these people who are sort of rich and have an access to a desktop computer. Their primary technologies have been served on computers which used to have internet connection. And for companies like us, we know that the consumers of our will have a smartphone. So our magic is smartphone, and that is where Indians are building it. 
and with the kind of support that startups get, it is incredible. And I'm, I'm totally thrilled. I've been a startup person for the last 15 years. In a way, I'll wishfully remain forever in my life. And I can say that no other government ever thought of these young companies to be thought about and talked about like we have in this country at this government stage. And uh, I, I wish that all of us Indian entrepreneurs prove to the world that India will not be the third world when it comes to the technology and it will be the first world and lead the way forward for the world to see it from and learn from India. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that's, that's one of the definite ways of going forward and who better to get to, to elaborate on that than Amitabh Kant, who's uh, one of the people who's been very closely involved with the entire theme of, of Startup India, along with Make in India, of course. Amitabh, startups in particular, uh, India is already has become one of the major startup hubs in the world. Uh, and that's not necessarily something that should surprise us because Indians are among the most entrepreneurial of people. They may not be the most organized of people, but they are certainly the most entrepreneurial of, of people. Um, and of course, if you look at startup hubs elsewhere in the world, notably Silicon Valley, it's largely been driven by Indians. There's a very disproportionate share of Indians there. So what Vijay was saying that this is really the path, uh, unleash the entrepreneurial instincts of the Indian people and allow the startup wave to take India forward. That something you believe in? No, I greatly believe in it because the only way India can catch up with the rest of the world and grow at rates of 9 to 10% per annum is if we use technology to leapfrog. Uh, the challenge for India is really to become the most... Uh, you know, if you have a billion biometrics, and if you're going to buy 2024, if you're going to have a billion uh, smartphones, uh, you need to become the most disruptionist nation in the world. You know, the West has always innovated, but India needs to innovate for uh, the next one billion population of India, but also for the seven billion population. And India needs to innovate in urbanization. It needs to innovate for sewage. It needs to innovate for clean water. It doesn't need to innovate for driverless car, but it needs to innovate for Indian and the rest of the people. And therefore, my view is that the process of... Uh, uh, technology needs to embed our process of urbanization, which will be one of the biggest challenges which India will face. If by 2050, 700 million people are going to get into the process of urbanization, India will have to do very innovative and very sustainable urbanization, all on the back of good technology. Right, so if you're looking at just to prioritize that, so startups will happen, urbanization will happen, and use disruptive technologies, you're saying, in everything that is happening across the board, not just in the startup era. Uh, well, startups will cut across. You know, they'll disrupt the world not merely of digital technology, but they'll disrupt health, they'll disrupt education, they'll disrupt the process of embedding urbanization, they'll uh, do a lot of more social innovation across sector, and that's happening actually. So Indian startups are bringing the kind of energy and vibrancy which has rarely been seen before. Right, it's a very good way of looking at it. It's just, sometimes people think startups are only in the digital area, but actually they, they do cut across. John Roderick, if I can just get you in. Um, I think it was a year ago, perhaps right here at the World Economic Forum, that you had expressed the views that perception of India was still to change dramatically you know, elsewhere in, in the world, and there was still a certain amount of skepticism elsewhere. In the year that's passed since then, has that perception changed, uh, or is it still, there's still a certain amount of skepticism that the India story is often being talked up, but sometimes not, the promise is not always delivered? Um, thank you, uh, Vikram. Um, I, I really think there is, in short, every reason to be very bullish and optimistic uh, about India. The promise, uh, I suppose, was always there. Um, yeah. But what has changed over the last years is that particularly the government has become a facilitator and a driver of change, and it should be recognized, perhaps to the surprise of many skeptics and cynics around the world. Um, and I really would like to pay, uh, pay homage uh, to that. Uh, that. That that really has taken place. Uh, you mentioned the competitive index uh, jump that was made. Um, foreign direct investment uh, was was made last year. I believe 62 billion uh, was invested by foreign uh, foreign uh, investors in India. Um, every year, AT Carney, my company, publishes the FDI index, which is a forward-looking index. So where. Uh, investors anticipate to invest uh, money in. And there, uh, India, for the first time, jumped into the global top 10. So uh, we very much expect this FDI flow to, uh, to continue. Um, we should also, however, recognize that there's still, uh, and we all know that, um, uh, many challenges uh, remain ahead. Um, 
uh, we are very fortunate to work with the World Economic Forum and many, uh, many partners on a, a multi-year project uh, to look at the future of production of manufacturing. And obviously, Make in India comes, uh, comes to mind uh, there. Um, the work is still ongoing, um, but what is already becoming clear uh, is that uh, the Make in India program, uh, which is a very ambitious program, to, um, uh, to deliver up to 100 million jobs uh, by the year 2022, uh, and already good progress has been made. The challenges uh, will, however, be daunting there. You mentioned the forced, fourth industrial revolution, all the digital developments. Well, there's a healthy tension uh, between jobs and digital developments, and we all are beginning to understand that. And uh, we really hope that this conference, the next two days, will be able to talk about that, how we can overcome them, uh, how we can make it positive, how we can make sure that progress is inclusive uh, and, uh, um, and, um, um, and have a very good discussion on that. So we're looking forward to about that. Right. Uh, Gita, let me get some final thoughts from you before I come back to the panel with actual steps that need to be taken. Your take on where India is positioned right now? Uh, India is in a very, uh, very strong position. Uh, it's been touted as... Uh, one of the markets to go to with the source of uh, growth in the world economy. So it really has a, a very good standing. Uh, the question to look for, forward, and I hope this uh, summit delivers on that, is how is it that India can sustain this growth over many decades? Not over the next five years, but you know, across political cycles, across elections, manages to sustain this. Because we've had many episodes of countries that have had spurts of growth, things look great and promising, but then you, know, you have a lost decade at the end of it. So if you look at countries in Europe, if you look at Greece, at one point Greece looked like the destination to go to, and it's pretty much undone most of the growth it's had uh, over the last 10 years. And so I would really hope, and this is the biggest challenge for any country in the world, is to have sustainable growth. I mean, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It could just be 8%, but 8% growth for a, few dec for a couple of decades would be absolutely fantastic. To do that, you would require to continue doing these reforms. You'd have to continuously see improvements, the ease of doing business, in the competitiveness. The social institutions, the political institutions, the economic institutions have to keep pace with it. Uh, and if that's done, and if the world notices that this is actually happening in a sustainable way, then that will be absolutely mind-blowing for India. Well, 8% growth is reasonably dramatic, especially if it's carried on over a couple of decades. Yes, but that's exactly what we should, we should be talking about. I mean, we are in a session called the inflection point. I think if, that, if there is an inflection point, it will be if right. India can stay at a numbers like that for a long period of time. And I think, uh, before I turn to the audience, I, I think I actually completely agree with you that that is really the challenge, to make sure that whatever is happening, it's not a spurt, because country after country around the world has spurted and then it falls away. If you really want transformation, what China and some of the others were able to do, Korea, is have that growth for a prolonged period of time, and that's when you really get transformation. <laughs>
making sure transparent processes are established. These are being very well received even by the Aam Janta, the common people. And if that's going to be a vote-winning proposition, therefore, if the people are able to receive it as a good idea, and it makes a difference to their lives, I can see that uh, the 8% growth argument moving not just with one particular government, but with every government which is ruling in the states and also future governments in Delhi. So it is such achievable. Now the happy mo moment is that people have recognized that the factors on which we have to work are actually giving political dividends. And that's where I think political parties cannot be different from one another. Right, that's, a, that's an interesting point. And when good economics becomes good politics, that's when you are guaranteed continuity across political cycles, which is what she was talking about. Um, Ara, of course, and just saying that, just keep on voting back, voting us back, and that's one other Obviously. way of doing it. Obviously. <laughs> okay. That, that's the other way of doing it. All right. Um, quickly, uh, if I could just ask you, John, any one suggestion that you think you would make to say whatever is being seen is, can be made sustainable? And do you think it is sustainable in India? Well, I think it is sustainable, but you, you have to think about what's required for the 21st century and a new set of skills. I mean, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution. That we, thought, we, thought, we think about this convergence between digital and industrial. The way you lead in the 21st century is different. The way you run a manufacturing facility, the way you run a startup, you have a different set of skills that's required to win in this century. And are we collectively, it's a government responsibility, it's a company responsibility, are we investing in the right training and capacity building to deliver on an economy that we want to grow 8% a year for 20 years? All right, make sure you're investing in the right things, by which I, I guess you would include skills, education, perhaps healthcare, and in addition yeah, to- Yeah, and basic infrastructure. You can't, basic do, infrastructure. You can't do it if, if you have 200 million people without electricity. 8% right. mean, growth for 20 years is really hard to achieve, right? Fair enough, and another one? Make sure that the basics are delivered. That's the, that's the first thing. Invest in the right things, including basic infrastructure. What would be the one item on your agenda? No, I'm again coming to the same point is the SMEs. We consume 10, we manufacture or consume 10% with a similar population, 10% of what China does. So India is to find India, to produce India, make in India. That's what I believe. All right. Vijay, quickly, any one fine point that you would yeah. like to then read? Um, I, I'll give a metaphor quickly that, uh, and I fundamentally believe that for next five years, India's opportunity is mobile internet. And uh, just remember that when it used to be telecom networks, Europeans built it, the Nokias and the Siemens of the world. And when it came to the devices that networks were using, then more or less North America took it from BlackBerry to the Apple on Android. And now comes the era of apps and services on top of these networks. and. This is the space that is meant for India because we have created software for the world. We've, we've learned the art and science of how to build world-class software. And this is what is our opportunity. Now, with the programs like Startup India, I do know that there is an attention to it. But at the same point in time, you should remember that we're talking about Indian consumers. So attention to the broadband. And I understand that basic infrastructure has been a more requirement. But I would not shy away from saying, how about putting into the internet into the basic infrastructure? The fourth industrial revolution that we talk about is requirement that there is an internet there in everybody's hand. So roti, kapla, makan, and internet, maybe that is the how we have to change in the 21st century our expectations from the government, not just roti, kapla, or makan elements there. And remember, once you do that, then startups can create a ton of jobs also here. And I think the opportunity of creating jobs from SMEs to opportunity to create jobs from building these technologies, uh, see, see the taxi sharing services. Our Indian company, Ola, has been able to get jobs and create at so many people who were otherwise not having a job by offering them incentives and coming on the network of ride sharing. So elements like these, uh, I, I think okay. technology has an opportunity to create jobs which we need more technology enablement as a part of government's core play. All right, Amitabh, one quick word from you and then I'm going to turn to the audience because we are already uh, running uh, You over. want to grow at 8% on a sustained basis for three decades. You need a radical restructuring of your education and health uh, system. Uh, you need to bring the same energy into your health and education as we brought into our startup movement. Without that, it'll be impossible to grow. Sustained basis, three decades, a completely new education system is required. All right. 
John, anything you want to add which hasn't been mentioned already? <laughs> I think a lot of people, a lot of things have been mentioned already. I would like to reiterate the tension that there is between technological progress, the fourth industrial revolution, and India is already and has to do much more of that. There simply is no choice. And the creation of jobs. And as a democracy, that's the obligation of India to do that. There's a healthy tension between uh, the two. And I really hope that the next two, uh, two days will uh, shed some light on that. All right, with automation, perhaps uh, jobs becomes, a, becomes an issue. If, if too many jobs are taken away by newer technologies and that becomes its own challenge. Uh, uh, indeed. And I just want to emphasize something that was raised earlier, which is, for me, the number one priority is skilling. And okay. the reason I say that is because the returns to skilling have gone up so much. Uh, the big source of, one of the big sources of increase in inequality in the world is because of the much higher returns to skilling. And so India needs to tap into that. And unfortunately, though we've had skilling programs that have been set up over the last few years, the outcomes are not desirable. All right, um, I think we are, we are over time uh, a little bit, but I'm gonna try and get just one or maybe two comments. So the gentleman here in the second row, yeah. Yeah, just speak. Yeah. Oh, there, Mike is coming to you. As we bring efficiency to industry, or to agriculture, or to our social sector. By necessity, it will result in job eliminations. Some jobs are lost when efficiencies come. So okay. there will be a transition period when we will see jobless growth, So, which has been the case for a while, when we, India has registered growth, but at the same time, jobs have not grown. And two have to be managed together optimally as we go through restructuring. So okay. while skilling is an enabler, skilling will not create jobs. So what should be the strategy of the country that we find jobs for which skilling is an enabler? We will need to do that. All right, let's hope the forum over the next couple of days finds the answer to that particular question. I'd like to thank all the co-chairs for having been with us uh, as well. And let's hope some of the points that were thrown up and some of the questions that still remain, we will actually get answers uh, during the World Economic Forum's India Economic Summit. Thank you.